Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to The Psychedelic Scientist. This is a channel where I share the latest findings and developments in psychedelic science in a way that's accessible but not superficial at the same time. My name is Manesh, I'm the host. I'm a neuroscience PhD student with ongoing research related to psychedelics, among other things. So in this video, I'm going to be diving into some of the latest neuroscience findings that tell us how psilocybin, or the active compound in magic mushrooms, might work in the brain. In this video, I'm going to be focusing primarily on brain imaging research. That is, research that's been conducted with the functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. This is my area of expertise, and it's also one of the areas that has seen the most new findings over the last uh, 5 to 10 years. If you're unfamiliar with fMRI and what it is, I highly recommend you check out my last video, which is entitled fMRI Brain Networks. So in terms of the structure of this video, first I'm going to be diving into some findings related to the so-called default mode network. You've probably heard of this network in the media and elsewhere, and if you don't know anything about it, again, check out my last video on brain networks. And after talking about the default mode network, I'm gonna talk about some findings that more so pertain to how psilocybin affects the entire brain. So the first fMRI study done with psilocybin was published back in 2012 by psychedelic researcher Robin Carhart Harris and his colleagues over at Imperial College London. And one of the main findings from this study was that psilocybin seemed to reduce activity in a variety of places in the brain. Most notably, this included the two core regions of the default mode network. These are the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. So these two regions essentially constitute the backbone of the default mode network and have the most connections to the rest of the default mode network and also the rest of the brain. So it seems that these are both becoming less active in the psilocybin state. And moreover, it seems that the posterior cingulate's activity in particular correlated with the intensity of subjective effects as reported by the participants. So essentially, the more they reported having intense subjective effects, the more their posterior cingulate decreased in its activity. And the study also found that the medial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate cortex, which are usually very connected to each other, become less connected in the psychedelic state. And so psilocybin seems to induce this disruption of regular default mode network functioning, where the core regions are becoming less active and less integrated with each other. A follow-up study also conducted on this same data set found that the default mode network also became more connected to a, a network called the dorsal attention network. The dorsal attention network is a network that's involved in our perception of the external world. It basically involves our attention and our ability to attend to different objects in our visual field. And usually this network is in competition with the default mode network because the default mode network mediates these kind of internally directed memory brace processes that are independent of the external environment. And so in this study, they kind of found that the default mode network and its external network were becoming more connected to each other, which might perhaps relate to a blurring of the distinction between internal and external experience. What's interesting is this pattern of connectivity was also found in meditators who practice non-dual types of meditation, which are essentially types of meditations aimed at experiencing the essential unity of internal or outer experience or subject-object. And there are also a couple of cool findings relating to the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a core memory region in the brain and is a part of the default mode network. And research with psilocybin has revealed that hippocampal activity patterns show greater variance in the psilocybin state relative to placebo. And what this essentially means is that its activity patterns go higher and lower, higher and lower, and are kind of erratic in this way, in a way that's actually consistent with more activity because the spikes are being higher. And also related to this, the same study found that the hippocampus campus enters into more dynamic patterns of connectivity with another region called the anterior cingulate cortex. So basically it seems that the hippocampus becomes more variable in its activity and more internally coordinated and also enters into more dynamic patterns or states with this other brain region. And of course this is speculative but these kind of changes in the hippocampus can relate to alterations in our stream of thought and other memory related processes. All right, so let me just give you a little interim summary. So psilocybin seems to reduce activity in the default mode network, reduces the connectivity between the two primary regions of this network, the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex, makes the default mode network less distinct from a network involved in the external attention, and also causes the core memory area to become a bit more crazy and dynamic and complex in its activity. Next, let's talk about how psilocybin affects the brain as a whole. And so first, I have to mention this study because you've probably seen this image in the media in various places. This study was actually very technical and the actual details of what this image represents are also very technical and nuanced. But basically we can understand it as showing that there are a greater number of persistent connections in the psilocybin state relative to placebo. And furthermore that these connections are primarily involving so-called hub regions which interconnect different brain networks.
networks. So this image is basically showing what it evidently shows is that the brain is becoming more connected in the psilocybin state, which means there's perhaps more information sharing going on and a blurring of distinct functions. And in addition to this study, two other studies have explicitly looked at how brain network interactions spanning the entire brain change under psilocybin. One of these studies, led by the team over at Imperial College London, found that the brain tended towards an increased integration of different brain networks. Networks in regions that usually weren't talking to each other were now all of a sudden talking to each other more, and regions and networks that were already talking to each other were talking to each other even more. And this seemed to be most the case for high-level networks such as the default mode network, and least the case for sensory networks such as the visual network and the network related to our sense of touch and movement. However, in a different study done with a different data set by a team at the University of Zurich found the opposite effects. They found that sensory regions became more integrated with the rest of the brain, whereas high-level networks such as the default mode network became less interconnected with the rest of the brain. Now, this is interesting. How can two data sets, both done with psilocybin, have opposite effects? And there are a variety of potential reasons for this related to dosage, related to technical details around how the data was collected. But I think most importantly, the use of a particular analysis technique called global signal regression. Global signal regression, or GSR, is a very controversial technique in the brain imaging research community. And actually is an active point of contention between the group in London and the group in Zurich slash Yale. But diving into the details of what this is and what that means is an advanced topic for a future video. Just know that in general that the findings I present are not always consistent across studies and there's a lot of nuance in the particular analysis techniques and other aspects of the experimental protocols. And there really needs to be more studies with a ton more participants to really get a concrete and reliable sense of what actually is occurring. And of course this is not even mentioning the fact that these findings are based on averaging over let's say a 5 to 10 minute period when of course the psychedelic experience is extremely dynamic and constantly changing. So there's a ton of work to do but it's extremely exciting and fascinating and is set to really grow and expand over the next decades. And with that please hit the like button if you like this video, leave me a comment below and hit that subscribe button for more more videos on the latest in psychedelic science.